again, Revelation chapter 13, we're continuing on with our study verse by verse uh, in this marvelous book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. We're in chapter 13 and we're picking up with verse number 11. Uh, tonight we're going to uh, go all the way to the end of the chapter in verse number uh, 18. Revelation chapter number 13, beginning with verse number 11. The Bible says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the reading of the word of God once again this evening. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given us uh, to come together in the Lord's house and, and together to study the word of God. We thank you for allowing this time to uh, study together the marvelous book of the Revelation. Lord, you, it, truly, it is a revelation. You reveal so much to us, the things that are coming to this earth. And so, Lord, we thank you that, that you tell us uh, in advance of what's going to happen, and you give us your word, which is sure. And, Lord, we thank you and praise you again for the wonderful truth of the rapture, that all who belong to you through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> all that are the children of God by faith in Jesus, then born again by the Spirit of God, bought by the blood, the precious blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ that he shed on Calvary's cross. 
Lord, that we are delivered from the wrath to come, that we will be taken out before these events take, uh, take place upon the earth. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we do pray that you'd help us to understand your word in the revelation now, that we could be a help to others. And Lord, we pray that souls could be saved and lives would be changed and that revival would come. And we'll thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. you. May be seated. I don't know about you, but I, I do feel that way. The more, I, I, as I read further in Revelation, the more I want to say thank God for the rapture. Amen. I thank God that I believe that, that the Bible teaches a, a pre-tribulational uh, rapture of the body of Christ. I believe it with all of my heart. And, and so we won't be here, but God gives us in the revelation uh, the events that are coming to the earth involving, all involved in what we call the second coming of Christ uh, back to the earth uh, once again. Here in Revelation chapter 13, we're, we've been looking at the Antichrist and especially the beginning of the second half of the tribulation period, uh, a time of great tribulation on the earth, a time referred to as Jacob's trouble. It's a time when the Antichrist is revealed. He reveals his true colors. Remember when he first, uh, following the rapture, and he first comes on the scene, he's going to just, it seems like he's the savior of the world. I mean, he's going to bring peace all around the world. But then halfway into it, three and a half years into it, there will be that which Jesus referred to in Matthew chapter 24 as the abomination of desolation. It'll take place in the newly rebuilt temple, uh, the newly built temple in Jerusalem that's not there now, but it will be at this time and will be there after, after we're gone in the rapture. And so he'll show himself and uh, get on the throne and, and claim to be God. Well, it'll be that time when there'll be many, especially the Jews, I believe, that will wake up uh, and they will recognize, hey, this is no savior of theirs. Uh, this is the Antichrist. The real Christ already came and we missed him. And so the Bible, we've read already how that uh, the uh, Jewish people will flee uh, from the wrath of the Antichrist that God himself uh, has prepared uh, a place uh, in the wilderness uh, where Israel and the people of Israel could be uh, kept, could be taken care of during that last half of the tribulation period and that's in chapter 12 uh, of Revelation. And then, and then when we come to uh, chapter number 13, we see the, we see the, the, the devil's program really coming into being. And so that's what we've got here from verse 11 down to the close of the chapter. Uh, we see that how that the Antichrist will have what we could call a propaganda agent. Someone who will make him popular and make him, make the Antichrist known to the world. In verse 11 and verse 12, once again, John said, and I beheld another beast Remember that first beast was the Antichrist. And he says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And so this is one that's going to come up. John describes him as another beast, a second beast. Uh, just like the Antichrist was a beast that came up out of the sea, uh, here is a second beast that comes up out of the land or comes up out of the earth, and his purpose is to point others to the first beast and to cause others to worship and follow the first beast. And so the first beast, the Antichrist, comes out of the sea. I, I think we could probably geographically uh, be all right to name that the Mediterranean Sea, no, no doubt, in that part of the world where all this will be happening. And, that, and coming out of the Mediterranean Sea would be an interesting uh, thing to note. And that is that the old Roman Empire, 
Uh, remember the Roman Empire in the days of the New Testament, in the days when that we read about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the book of Acts, uh, the Roman Empire uh, was in effect in those days at that time. And then even following, uh, book of Acts and, and, and following for three, four hundred uh, years uh, or, or more, seems like. And, and so you've got this Roman Empire. Where is that? It, it's, it's borders right around the Mediterranean Sea. Everything's around the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and so the first beast came out of there. The second beast comes out of the earth. Now, now the, the second beast uh, uh, it may look like a lamb. You notice how it said here he had, uh, he had uh, two horns like a lamb. He may look like a lamb, uh, but his voice is not the voice of a lamb. It is the voice of a, of a dragon. It's the voice of a, of a dragon. It said in verse 11 that he spake as a dragon. And, and so get the picture of what's going on here. First of all, we already know that that old, that old serpent, the dragon, that we've already seen introduced to us in the book of the Revelation is none other than Satan himself. And in fact, it makes it very clear because it calls him that old serpent, uh, also called Satan, uh, the old dragon, the serpent, the dragon, uh, and he's also called Satan. And so that's the devil himself. And, and so we could say that the dragon is anti-God. And then you've got the first beast that comes out of the sea, and that is anti-Christ. And that first beast is the son of the dragon. He's the son of the devil. And so he's the anti-Christ. This second beast now is the anti-Holy Spirit. You've got Satan really doing all that he can to, uh, to imitate God. Comes on the scene himself as God or as, as God the Father. And then the beast that comes out of the sea, the Antichrist, uh, comes on the scene as the son of Satan. Now this second one comes on the scene as the anti-Holy Spirit. He's also known as the false prophet. And as the false prophet here in the book of Revelation, he is the unholy spirit. You say amen to that? That would be a good name for him here. He is the unholy spirit. And so notice again, all the devil can do and all he tries to do is trying to imitate God. Uh, what was the work of the Holy Spirit of God? The Holy Spirit of God was the work of causing believers to love and to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that Satan, the devil, is a counterfeiter. Uh, he, he can't do anything originally on his own. He, he, he's just copying, uh, trying to copy God. And uh, we understand that. Uh, this unholy spirit, as we've already seen in our text, that he will cause people to worship the beast, to worship the Antichrist, the son of the devil. The Holy Spirit leads us and helps us to worship Jesus, the Son of the living God. Amen. The unholy spirit in this day will lead people to worship the Son of Satan, the Antichrist, here in the time of the Revelation. And, and so the question then would be, how does he do it? What is this unholy spirit going to do? When, when he comes on the scene in that latter half of the tribulation period. Well, this is how he's going to do it, how he's going to turn people to uh, the Antichrist and cause people to bow down and worship uh, the Antichrist and serve him. He's going to do it, I believe, number one, by deceiving wonders. By deceiving wonders in verse 13, verse number 14. Notice this again. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And so he's going to point people to the Antichrist by these deceiving wonders uh, that he will be able to perform. So let me ask you a question and think about this. Do, does the devil, uh, does Satan 
uh, th does the devil really have powers to do miracles? Well, the answer is, he sure does. Sure he does. It says so right here. It says in verse 15, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do. And so, yeah, the devil's able to do miracles. In Revelation chapter 16, Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14, uh, John tells us there, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. That's that unholy spirit. He says, for they are the spirits of devils. And then look at this. If you're looking, verse 14 of Revelation 16, they are the spirits of devils working miracles. Do you see that? Working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. And so, yes, Satan has power to work miracles. Satan's demons have powers uh, to work miracles. And, 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 you th and, and this is not the first time that we can see uh, the truth of this back over in Exodus. All the way back in the Old Testament book of Exodus, if you would look at chapter number 7, Exodus chapter number uh, 7, this is the time that Moses uh, comes before Pharaoh. Moses has been sent by God, you remember, from that burning bush out on the backside of the desert. Uh, God told Moses, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to tell him to let my people go. And so there in, back in Egypt, Moses is confronting uh, Pharaoh uh, back in Exodus chapter number 7. And beginning with verse 8, if you'll notice this, And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you, then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it did become, it became a serpent. And then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, uh, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments, for they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. What about that? And Aaron's rod, but Aaron's rod, rod swallowed up their rod. God's uh, miracle was greater than Satan's miracle. Amen. But nonetheless, there you have that other indication now that, that the devil actually does have deceiving powers and is able to uh, perform miracles. And you say, well, how do these things happen? Uh, I, I really believe such things happen still in our world today. There are demonic spirits that are set loose in the world today. And yes, they do uh, deceiving wonders and they, uh, they do supernatural things. They are supernatural beings. And so how, how does it happen? How would such things even happen today? Uh, there is, understand this, in, in our time even right now, there is a dark and a devilish power in the world. Can you say amen to that? There's absolutely no doubt about it. We must understand this, church, that we believe that, that God is real and, and that Jesus is the Son of God and that the Holy Spirit is real and lives within us and leads us and guides us and helps us and, 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 and that God can, still does miracles for us uh, in, in our lives even still today. I believe that he does. Well, we can also need to understand that just as God is real and Jesus is real, the Holy Spirit is real, the angels of God uh, are real. And, and the Bible teaches us, I believe, that there is such a thing as a, as a guardian angel. There are times when an event may take place in your life. Maybe it's an automobile accident. Maybe it's something else. And somehow or another, the danger is just, is just uh, put away. And you say, how in the world did I get out of that? How in the world did I get saved out of that? I, I believe God's got his angels at work. Uh, in the world today. And, and so, uh, same thing, we have to understand that the devil is real, that, that his demons are real, 
and that his demons are real in the world today and they have devilish powers that, that is at work in the world today. And, and so you say, you say, well, the thing about it is uh, these, these uh, powers that are going to be exhibited in the time of the second half of the tribulation period, they are for the purpose of drawing people's attention to the Antichrist that they might believe and follow uh, the Antichrist. There's much in the world today it's called the occult. Uh, that is demonic worship, satanic worship, witchcraft, and all of those things have actually become popularized in America in the entertainment uh, industry from, uh, from, uh, um, from Hollywood and, 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 and from Disney. They're popular, popularizing these things. Why? Because it, it's a real thing. We think they're fairy tales, they're myths or something. Oh, it's getting the world ready for the time that such activities are going to be taking place uh, on the earth. And, and so here's the thing. Some people just marvel at these things. I like to say tonight, don't, don't put your eyes just on the miracles, but don't put your eyes on the wonders, but put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? And put your eyes and your mind upon the Word of God. If your eyes, your mind, and your heart is not on this book, my friend, it's not in this book, it's not in the Word of God. If your faith is not in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are setting yourself up to be deceived. You're setting yourself up to be, uh, to be led to follow the devil. That's what's happening here in the book of Revelation. It's going to be happening on the earth. And it's happening in, in countless uh, numbers of people's lives in the world today. They're living for uh, such things. And much of it has to do with, with strange, or we might say weird things, and how can somebody believe that? But it's, if we're, they'll turn around and say, how can we believe that the Holy Spirit works in our lives? You see? And so you've got, you've got Satan and he's got these powers. He's the enemy of God. We need to keep our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and our eyes and our, and our mind and our heart upon the word of God because Satan is a deceiver and he deceives by these, by these wonders and by these miracles. And then another way that this unholy spirit will do the job of drawing people to the Antichrist it's not only by deceiving wonders, but you know he'll actually do it by a forced worship. A forced worship. Notice in verse 14 and verse 15, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And then watch verse 15. And, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. It, that he will cause people to run to the Antichrist by forced worship. That if they do not worship this image of the beast, if they do not worship the powers of Satan, if they do not worship the, the work of the Antichrist, if they do not worship these things, uh, it, they, they will be killed. And so it's either worship the image of the beast or be killed. It's a matter of a forced worship. You see, Satan's unholy desire has always been that he, he wanted to, he wanted to uh, supplant God. He, he wanted to be over God. He, he, his whole thing was mutiny uh, against, against God. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 14. Here's what he, Satan or Lucifer said. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. He wants to be God. Now understand this. The devil is absolutely not against worship. He is not against worship at all. In fact, his desire is to be worshipped. And, and, and I don't want to get off and, 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 and take up a lot of time on this, but most of us here should know, I would think that we already do know, that if you look back at some of the things in America, 
in our lifetime. And, and, and for me, it's like, especially if you look back at the music industry, nowadays it's the, it's the movies, the entertainment, as I said, Hollywood and Disney and all this with, the, with the, uh, the, the witches and the wizards and the warlocks and the Harry Potters and the, uh, all, all the other things, the zombies, all the other things that's just gotten so popularized uh, in America today. Uh, you look back at that. But I look back in my generation when, uh, when uh, a real satanic uh, rock and roll uh, entertainment industry began to flourish, began to really take off. And there was a number of those uh, nationally known, perhaps worldwide known uh, rock and roll groups and singers that would actually have their concerts, their events, and would literally refer to them as a place of worship. And they were worshiping the flesh, and they were worshiping the devil. And, they, and these were kids, young kids, high school kids, and college kids and stuff, you know, flocking in there really, I think, maybe at the beginning, not knowing what they were getting themselves into. But they really would lead them into a worship experience, worshiping uh, the devil. He's not against worship. Uh, he's always for worship. He always desired to be worshipped. And he will seek a worldwide worship in the second half of the tribulation period by establishing a one world religion, a one world economy, a one world government, and literally force the world to worship him. Now think of those things. One world religion, one world economy, one world government. Folks, that's being talked about today and it's been being talked about for years. And there are leaders, even, even leaders in the political realm and governments and everything that have been involved in this thing. You can, you can, you can look it up and you can study it uh, for yourself. But uh, they, they involved with meetings, the UN and all these things, and they use these terms, the new world order, they, they, want a, they, they want a one world economy right now. They're trying to push for that now. Uh, I really believe that, that our president today and others that are with him, that they are very well wanting to have a, a, a worldwide government type of situation. They study this. They're thinking about this. They're making plans towards it. You say, what is that all about? Well, I think the devil is involved in all of it because it's going to get people's minds ready for Revelation chapter 13. Amen. They're going to be ready uh, to turn after the Antichrist. Now, here's the difference, though. God never has and He never will force anyone to worship Him. Amen? God does not do that. Instead, you know what God has done? God has demonstrated His love by sending His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to take our place on the cross. And He died for us that we might be able to live for Him. And, and because of that, He is worthy of our worship. Can you say amen to that? He is worthy of our worship. He does not force us to worship Him. He does not force us to love Him. Instead, what He has done is that He has shown and He has proven His love for us to such an extent that it ought to be, it would be our heart's desire that we want to worship Him, amen, that we want to love Him because He's worthy. In John chapter 4, John chapter 4 and beginning with verse number 19, this is the time when Jesus is meeting with the woman at the well in Samaria. And they began a, a conversation after uh, Jesus told her that uh, he asked her about her husband. And she said, she said, I have no husband. He said, well, you're right about that, but you've had five. So you have five and the one you've got now you're just living with. He's not really your husband. And then in verse 19, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. You know what she's doing? She's trying to change the subject. <laughs> she's trying to get off of that. Uh, what they were discussing. She's trying to change the subject. She said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And, then, and so then she says, Our fathers worship in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh uh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. 
Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And it is. Jesus Christ uh, was, has been given to the world by way of the Jewish nation. He says, he said, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah uh, cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And then it says, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. I that speak unto thee am he. He is the one that is worthy of worship. The conversation is about worship. And she says, well, I know that when the Messiah comes, that's the one we're going to worship. And, he, and it's like he says, well, 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 daughter, you're talking to him right now. And he's the one that told her that if you'll just ask me, I'll give you living water that will just well up in your soul and just spring up. You'll, you'll never thirst again. He's the one that told her, if you'll just ask of me, I'll give you what you need that will meet your need to the fullest. I'll give you living water, spiritual life. I'll give you eternal life. That's in essence what Jesus is teaching, was teaching to the woman there in their conversation about the well. And he says, you must worship God in spirit and in truth. And so, so she says, well, I know when the Messiah comes, then, then we'll be able to do that. And Jesus said, he's here. He said, I am he. He says, he's here. Now's the time to worship and, and, and to serve God. And, and so God does not force anyone to worship him. He proves his love to us, but the devil will, will force people to worship him. And so that's how this unholy spirit does his work, by deceiving wonders, by forced worship. And then in verse 16, uh, down through verse number 18, he does it by controlling the wealth. By controlling the wealth. There'll be a, a, there'll, there'll be a great work of, of controlled wealth in the tribulation period. Now doesn't that sound kind of familiar to us today? Because if you're keeping up with some of the things that you can find on the news about the agenda of, uh, of our president and, and of others, especially the far left, uh, in, the, in the Congress and so forth. Uh, this is the very thing that they're seeking to try to do now. We put the name, we put the term socialism on it. We say, you know, it's, it's the Bernie Sanders thing and, and all the people, you know, that, that want to follow uh, his way of doing things or the way that they want things in their government. Look at what's going on right now this week with this massive spending bill. It's going from the Congress, from the House now. It's going to be going to the Senate. And they're telling us the Republicans in the Senate says they've got a couple of Democrats with them and, and uh, they're going to have to, they're going to change that thing. They're not going to accept it the way it is. They're going to have to change it. So then it's got to go back to the Congress. And then I just saw, heard on a news report today that the, that the progressives, uh, the, the far left, the one, the woman called AOC, you know, and, and, and that and that crowd, they've already come out and made a statement that if they change it and we don't get what we want, then we're not going to vote with our own party. We're not get, we're not even going to vote with it when it comes back to the Congress, and so it's just going to be sitting there. Well, what a mess, Amen. What a mess that it is, and the whole purpose, I believe, is to control the wealth. Uh, there's things in that bill that is really really kind of frightening, and you've seen it about our bank accounts and, and, and so forth that, that our president you know, is, is, is trying to push across. It's, this, it, it, it's coming, folks. It's coming. Yes. And it's coming here, Revelation 13. Notice it, verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now let me just pause and say this for a moment. Do, do, do you not see kind of a uh, kind of a, uh, a comparison here with what we've been going through just here recently now with the COVID situation, and in particular the 
the, the, the vaccine mandates, the talk about having to have a, 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 a COVID vaccine passport. You have to have that to go anywhere, to do anything. You gotta have the proof that you've had your vaccination. Now, now, I'm all for the vaccinations. As you know, my wife and I, we've gotten the vaccination. I, I, you know, I plan to get the booster and all. I, I just, you know, I, I believe it's good for me. I believe, it's, I believe it's the right thing for us. But I don't go along with this thing of the government uh, forcing people and such things. But when you talk about things like mandates, uh, passports, cards and stuff, things you've got to prove to be able to travel, to get on a plane, to go here, go there, do that. Uh, folks, this is, this is just getting society ready for Revelation 13. Because there's going to be a time no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six. There's coming a time when this false prophet, this unholy spirit, will control the wealth and the commerce of the world. And, and if you do not already have the seal of the Holy Spirit, if you've not already been born again, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been saved by His grace. And when the rapture takes place, you're going to be called up and, and, and taken into glory to be in the presence uh, of the Lord. If that's not happened for you and, and the rapture happens, you find yourself left behind and you find yourself eventually in this great tribulation period, three and a half years into it, into the seven years. So uh, you find yourself in this time that we're reading about in, in uh, Revelation chapter number 13. You will be branded by this beast. And the only way that you can purchase anything is to show your mark. The only way you can obtain medicine when you're sick is to show your mark. The only way to buy gas is to show your mark. That's the kind of world that it's going to be. And it's just amazing to me how that there are politicians and there are people that are really trying to craft together some kind of plan for that type of world even, even as we speak today. And so you've got to have a mark. So what is the mark? Well, there have been books that have been written. There's been sermons that have been preached. There's been ideas. There's been speculations. There's been all kinds of things about about, about the mark. What is that mark going to be? Uh, well, verse 18, uh, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, and six, or six, six, and six. Well, how do we understand that? It's easy to complicate it, and it's easy to suppose it out into, you know, tremendously strange thing. Uh, it's easy to try to uh, put it into some of the technology that we have today with the computers and how it works on numbers. And, and I'll be one of the first to admit to you, you know, all of that is really some interesting things to look at and, and, and to read about. But really, what is it? Well, let's try to understand. It says, here's wisdom. If, if you can understand this, understand this. Six. In, 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 in what is called numerology or the study of numbers. And, 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 and that is, uh, that, that, that does bear out in the Bible. The Bible has a lot to do with numbers and so forth. Six is known as the number of man. Adam was created when? The sixth day. Adam was created on day number six. This mark then in Revelation 13, uh, could not uh, ever be the number 777 because seven is the number of perfection and man is not perfect. Man is a sinner, amen. Uh, so it's the number of man, the number six. There are three numbers in, in man and three is the divine number. It has to do with the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so here, when you've got the three numbers, and, and the Bible says it's the number of a man. 
The number of a man is this 603 score and six. And so it's six, the number of man, three times. You see that? Three numbers, three times. And so this number is, is a man showing himself to be God. Show it three numbers. The number of man, three times. Three is the number of God. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. This is man making himself out to be God. And isn't that what we've learned is the very exact thing that Satan is seeking to do? And that's what this Antichrist is going to do in this second half of the tribulation period. He, he presents himself as God. And so it is a number of defiance and rebellion against God. That's the meaning of it. It is the number of defiance and rebellion against God. It's not a mystical number. It's not a magical number. There's not some kind of strange power that's attributed to the number 666. But no, what it does represent is defiance and rebellion against God because it represents uh, Satan's rebellion and then Satan's man, the Antichrist, coming on the earth. Here's, here's the thing. We see that all of this is coming. If you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, friend, you can, you can be so glad because you can know that you're not going to be here and you're not going to face these things. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're going to be, you could be left behind and you could be here at all of this. You could make it through the tribulation. You could trust Christ and be saved. Many will be, but you're going to have to suffer for it. You're going to have to endure through it. Uh, you will be very likely put to death because as it says here, if you do not bow down and worship the beast, if you do not take that mark, you'll be put to death for those that are left behind. But there will be those that will choose death rather than rebellion against God at that time and, and, and they will believe on Christ and they'll be saved. But by and large, people are just going to fall in line before this beast with all the wonders and all the deception and all the, all the force and all the threats and all the things that this Antichrist and his unholy spirit will be unleashing on the earth. The thing of that we really need to understand is this. We are so close to the coming of Christ that begins with the rapture. We are so close to it that we see people today getting their minds ready, getting thing, everything about them ready for the mark. They're, they're, they're getting ready for it. They're ready for this type of thing that is described in Revelation chapter number 13. Dear friend, don't be left behind. Trust Jesus Christ today. Amen? Amen. Trust Christ now and be saved before we get to this time. You can be. We're still in the age of grace right now. The time is short, but you can be saved today. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand together, church. Our heads bowed and eyes closed for prayer. Lord, we do thank you once again for the word of God. And Lord, we just pray now that you would continue to speak to our hearts. We thank you for the marvelous book of the Revelation. Help us, Lord, not to be fearful of the things that are coming because by, by your grace and by faith in you, we know that you're going to take us out before it all happens. You're going, we're going to be in heaven. We'll be in your presence. But Lord, there are many that are not ready. There may be fam there, there's family members, there's friends, there's neighbors, there's co-workers on the job that, that they're not ready. Lord, there may be some that would pick up this message and maybe they've been following the messages online in our study in the book of Revelation here at Grace Baptist Church and, and, and they're not ready. Lord, we pray that the Spirit of God would take the Word of God Take the word of God as it's preached and, and they would, they would uh, be convicted of their need for Christ and would, would turn to Jesus even, even in these moments 
and be saved. And Lord, for that, we give you the glory and we give you all the thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen. Brother Tim. 278.